Welcome back everybody to our studies in the history of Western philosophy, focusing specifically on medieval philosophy in this in this particular series. And this episode is going to be talking a bit more about the work of Anselm of Canterbury. That's what this essential chapter is going to be exploring. And within this line of inquiry, we're going to talk about arguably the most important or at least the most famous of the theories that were that were proposed uh, by Anselm of Canterbury. This is, of course, Anselm's ontological argument. Now, the ontological argument is very, very interesting in terms of the relationship that it has with, of course, the philosophy of religion. Uh, this is what the ontological argument essentially exists in. And it's also an argument that we have covered in previous videos on the philosophy of religion many years ago. Um, but I'm going to just go over it in this lesson and then talk about its challenges in the next lesson, just so that we're essentially covering all of our bases uh, when we are talking about the uh, talking about the philosophy of Anselm of Canterbury. So this is one of the most important contributions that Anselm made, not only to philosophy, but specifically to the philosophy of religion. This is the ontological argument. Now, the ontological argument forms part of a sort of collection or a, for a sort of family of arguments that are uh, proposed and have been proposed over the last thousand or so years in relation to arguments, philosophical arguments, that try to prove the existence of God. Now, there are a variety of different, um, uh, there are a variety of, of different versions of these arguments. There are a variety of different arguments uh, per se, in terms of there's the ontological, there's cosmological arguments, there's teleological arguments as well. And there's a variety of them uh, within each of those categories. And then even including within that, there are there are challenges and debates about um, the validity of these arguments, uh, challenges to various premises of these arguments, etc., etc. So within this line of inquiry, within this big old collection of argumentation, there is uh, arguably the ontological argument is one of the earliest in terms of that was proposed, especially when we think about Anselm himself proposing this in a very early part of, of medieval philosophy. And essentially, Anselm of Canterbury's ontological argument aims to try and prove the existence of God through reason alone. Um, so he tries to prove this a priori um, without any kind of reference to empirical evidence or empirical understanding. So some arguments for the existence of God require require empiricism, require a certain degree of looking at the world and looking at reality. Um, some require thought experiments, some require deference to morality, some, like this one, requires us to have a basic understanding of premise and logic. And that's what um, this ontological argument essentially exists to do. It is presented um, in his work Proslogium, uh, which was written around 1077 to 1078. Now, the ontological argument looks as follows. Um, he first makes a definition. He tries to define God, okay? And he defines God as, quote, that than which nothing greater can be conceived. So he's placing a particularly high standard on, on the definition of God, trying to, trying to conclude, essentially, that, that, that God is the greatest thing. God is the greatest thing that could ever be conceived. It is that than which nothing else could be conceived that is better than God. Okay, this is the this is the the, the Latin for that particular um, quotation. I'm not going to try and read it. I can't read Latin, at least not at the moment. Um, Anselm posits that if we can conceive of a being that is the greatest possible being that is perfect in every single way, that there could be nothing else that could be conceived of that is better than, that is greater than that of God, then he then makes jumps to the conclusion that he that this this being, that this thing must exist in reality, not merely within our minds or in, within fiction. And he makes this conclusion because if a being of this kind of nature, a being that is that than which nothing greater can be conceived, didn't exist in reality, then we would have a way to conceptualize a being that is greater than the being that is that than which nothing greater can be conceived, because we can conceive of a being that is that, that does exist in reality. It would have to exist in reality in order for it to be the greatest being. 
And you can, uh, the, one of the uh, old Crash Course uh, philosophy videos, I believe, uses the example of a pizza or a unicorn, I believe, but it, many years ago since I last watched it, um, where they use the example of, okay, well, if you think about the greatest slice of pizza in the world, okay, a slice of pizza that is that than which nothing greater can be conceived, there could not be a better pizza slice in any in any conceivable way, you would probably conclude that that pizza slice would have to exist in reality because if it didn't, you could conceive of one that is better. That is one that you could actually eat and actually consume and actually enjoy. And so within that same kind of line of argumentation, uh, Anselm makes that conception of God. Anselm concludes, therefore, that God's existence has to be necessary. It cannot be contingent because the idea of contingency, the a contingent being, would not be the greatest possible thing that could be conceived because the contingent being would have to depend on something else for its own existence. Therefore, if God is defined as the greatest conceivable being, then God must exist necessarily. Um, and given that Anselm happily accepts that God can be defined as the greatest is conceivable being, uh, uh, Anselm concludes that God has to necessarily exist. So let's just summarize then. Um, God, premise one is that God is that than which nothing greater can be conceived. Premise two is that something that exists in reality would be greater than existing only in one's mind or one's imagination. Therefore, conclusion, God must exist in reality because otherwise he would not be that than which nothing greater can be conceived. That is the philosophical argument that presents, um, uh, presents the ontological conception of God. Along this line of argumentation, um, Anselm distinguishes between two different kinds of uh, existence, existence in understanding and existence in reality, as, as, as we've mentioned, in intellectual and in re. Um, and it is greater, according to Anselm, to exist in reality than to exist merely in understanding alone and it is from here that we that we that we derive premise two so premise one is relatively simple um the validity of premise uh, of the argument um, it, it, you know is is what it is um, but the soundness of the premises obviously can be debated but if we were to just for hypothetical um experimentation um say that God is indeed that than which nothing greater can be conceived. You might even find an atheist that would um, humour the existence of God and would conclude that in looking at the nature of God, they might even say that, yeah, well, if, if God exists, then he must surely be the greatest thing that's ever uh, existed, the greatest thing that could ever be conceived. So even a, an atheist might conclude that particular line of argumentation. The second point, the idea of a distinction in reality versus a distinction in understanding, existence in understanding and existence in reality, uh, is what pertains to premise two. And so that's what we see here with this distinction. Now, you could even fight on the argument that existence Existing in reality is not as good as existing in understanding alone. Some people might argue that the pizza analogy, it could only ever be that the greatest pizza that could ever be conceived can only ever be conceived in understanding because essentially reality never meets up to our expectations. And you can make that argument there. And so you can challenge this argument not only on it's it's basic flawed logic and and we will talk about that in the next lesson but you could also challenge it on premise two to what extent is it truly the case to what extent is it truly the case that the a thing that exists in understanding isn't as good as something that exists in reality you might come to a conclusion that your imagination your view your understanding of something is not as is, is sorry is better than the reality of that thing because sometimes you know reality uh, your expectation versus reality is is is, is sort of skewed and, and hampered in some kind of way So really in concluding here, despite its criticisms that we will get to in the next lesson, the argument continues to be discussed by a variety of different philosophers. We've got Descartes, you have Leibniz, you have thinkers like um, modern thinkers like William Lane Craig and, and Plantinga. Um, again, um, these are individuals that we will look to. Uh, we've all we've all explored it previously the Kalam cosmological argument, one that is one that is uh, proposed quite uh, vehemently by by William Lane Craig. Um, Anselm's exploration of God's existence through this idea of reason does 
contribute from a historical perspective to a quite strong development of theological thought within medieval Europe and it exemplifies this sort of scholastic movement within within religion and within within theology, specifically Christian theology, um, which really looks to attempt to reconcile faith uh, with rational inquiry.